appreciate everyone being here this morning and those who are visiting. We certainly want to welcome you and appreciate you for being here. We'll be turning over to John the 10th chapter. I want to read the first few verses of that chapter and then uh, center our minds upon one aspect that is discussed in the very first part of this uh, section. But Jesus says, Verily, verily, I say unto you, He that entereth not by the door into the sheepfold, but climbeth in some other way, the same as a thief and a robber. But he that entereth in by the door is the shepherd of the sheep. To him the porter openeth, and the sheep hear his voice, and he calleth his own sheep by name, and leadeth them out. And when he putteth forth his own sheep, he goeth before them, and the sheep follow him, for they know his voice. And a stranger they will not follow, but will flee from him, for they know not the voice of the stranger. This parable spake Jesus unto them, but they understood not what he spake or what these things were which he spake unto them. Then said Jesus unto them again, Verily, verily, I say unto you, I am the door of the sheep. All that ever came before me are thieves and robbers, but the sheep did not hear them. I am the door. By me, if any man enter in, he shall be saved, and shall go in and out and find pasture. In the seventh verse, Jesus proclaims himself as being the door of the sheep. And we want to look at this aspect. Uh, again, in verse 9, he proclaims, I am the door. And so we want to look at this aspect that Jesus is the door. Of course, we realize that that is figurative language. It represents an aspect or ideas to us. He's not a literal, physical door. And just as an aside, sometimes we are asked, well, do you believe the Bible is literal? Well, yes, uh, with a proper understanding of what you mean by literal. It uses figurative language, but it is literal. Uh, but it, the language sometimes is figurative, even as here. He is figuratively, he represents a door as what a door represents. And so uh, this morning, and Lord willing, next Sunday morning, we want to look at some ideas as to Jesus being the door and what that represents. The first, obviously, even within the context here, is that he is the door to salvation. If uh, you look again at verse 9, you see the context of what he is dealing with here. I am the door. By me, if any man enter in, he shall be saved. He shall go in and out and find pasture. He shall be saved. Jesus is that door of salvation. When Adam and Eve sinned, uh, back in the Garden of Eden, Genesis, third chapter, there was blood that was shed in relationship to their sin. God made an offering, a blood sacrifice, in which he would, took the skin of animals. Those animals had to be Killed thus, and he clothed them. And so you have a, an animal sacrifice, a blood sacrifice. We see Cain and Abel. Abel offered an acceptable sacrifice to God. It was a blood sacrifice, the blood of animals. And we could go on throughout the Old Testament saying a blood sacrifices that were offered. Now, that's not to say there were not other offerings made. There were grain offerings, for example, meat offerings. But we continually see how that there was a blood offering, a blood sacrifice, 
that was especially associated with sins on the great day of atonement as we would read about in Leviticus there was a blood sacrifice that was made for the sins of the people the Hebrews writer looking back upon Old Testament history would thus come to chapter 9 and verse 22 and write and almost all things are by the law purged with blood and without shedding of blood there is no remission and so he, he looks back through the centuries previous to this time and he recognizes blood is associated with forgiveness. You cannot have remission of sins without the offering of blood. And you see that again from the very beginning of time. And it was, but it was especially seen through the law of Moses and was brought to light even more so during that period of time. But as we look at that period of time, and all of those sacrifices that were made, they never could take away sin, not truly. In fact, the word remission is not found in the Old Testament. And read through, it's not there. Why? Because that concept was really unknown to the Jews and to those in the Old Testament period. Why? Because as the Hebrew writer again states in Hebrews 10 and verse 4, that it is not possible for the blood of bulls and goats to take away sin. They could not have true remission of sins through that offering of an animal. And the blood that that animal would shed could not take away their sins. Now there was, and the Hebrew writer explains this, uh, there was a, and we use the phrase, rolling forward of their sins on a yearly basis. The Hebrew writer actually puts it, there is a remembrance again made of their sins every year. And so every year all of the sins that they had committed comes back upon those individuals. And so another blood offerings on that day of atonement would again be made. And for a year those sins were, and again using our phraseology, rolled forward. But at the end of that year, what happened? All other sins came upon them. There was no true cleansing of sins. They never had a true remission of sins. Well, if the blood had to be shed in order to have the remission, and yet the blood of animals could not do it, then what's, going to, what's it going to take? Well, the blood of man, the only thing is the blood of man, you and I or someone else, ours could not take away sin. Why? Because we have committed sin within ourselves. And thus we are in need of remission. And since the wages of sin is death, if we die, if we shed our blood, then it's a shedding of our blood for our own sins because of what we have done within our life. It's not an offering for the sins of anyone. It is the just payment of the deeds that we have done and those deeds being, there is none righteous, no, not one, as the psalmist would put it, and that's quoted by uh, Paul in Romans 3rd chapter and verse 10, that we've all come short of the glory of God. And so it takes the blood of someone who did not sin, a sinless sacrifice. And thus Peter would write in 1 Peter 1 verses 18 and verse 19, for as much as you know that you were not redeemed with corruptible things, as silver and gold from your vain conversation received by tradition from your fathers. In other words, you could take all of the money, all of the goods, all of the riches that this world has to offer, and all of it combined could not take away one sin. You were not redeemed that way. But you were redeemed with the precious blood of Christ. 
as a lamb without blemish and without spot. Notice so that, that last phrase, that it is a lamb without blemish and without spot. In other words, here is someone who did no sin. And thus, he could make that sacrifice for sins and redeem man back to himself. Thus, Peter would write in chapter 2 of 1 Peter, in verse 22 through verse 24, concerning Jesus, who did no sin, neither was God found in his mouth, who, when he was reviled, reviled not again. When he suffered, he threatened not, but committed himself to him that judgeth righteously, righteously, who his own self bare our sins in his own body, on the tree, that we... That we being dead to sin, should live unto righteousness by whose stripe ye are healed. Notice, here is that Jesus of Nazareth. He did no sin. There's the statement right there. He can thus offer his own blood as a sinless sacrifice for the sins of other individuals. If I tried to offer my blood as a sacrifice for anyone else's sins, it wouldn't work. Why? Because I've committed sin within my own life. And as a result of that sin, it would be very simply the just reward of that which I've done, the sins that I've committed. But Jesus did no sin. And thus... He could offer his blood as a sinless sacrifice. He could die the death that you and I deserve. Again, the wages of sin is death. Romans 6 verse 23. That lust, when it hath conceived, it bringeth forth sin. And sin, when it is finished, bringeth forth death. James 1, 14 and 15. And thus, that's what we deserve. We all deserve, because of sin that we have committed within our own life, we deserve to be put to death. How are we going to escape that? It's only by the blood of someone coming along and saying, I haven't done anything wrong. I have not committed sin. Thus, I'm not worthy of death. And I'll step in and I'll take the punishment for you. And that's Jesus of Nazareth. And he died on our behalf. And thus it is a vicarious death. One dying on behalf of someone else. Jesus dying on behalf of us. But he is the only one, thus, who can open that door to salvation. At the beginning of Jesus' ministry, John the Baptist is sent as the forerunner of Jesus. And as that forerunner, he was to point people to Jesus. And as we read in John 1 and verse 29, John does this. That the next day it says, John sees Jesus coming unto him and said, Behold the Lamb of God, which taketh away the sin of the world. Now, to the Jew, that would have been a very graphic statement. Maybe not as much to us. Because on that great day of atonement, here was a lamb. It would take actually two lambs. One would be offered as, as a sacrifice. They would shed the blood of that one lamb. And the high priest would go in and offer blood first for his own sins. Then he would come out and go back in again and offer blood for the sins of the people. Then he would come out and they would, he would place his hands upon another lamb and that lamb then would, take, would be sent out into the wilderness representing that here's the taking away of sin. And all of the people there on the Day of Atonement, they were supposed to be there, all males were supposed to assemble at Jerusalem on that great day of atonement. Now then, they see this. 
and they see that lamb taking away, going out into the wilderness to take away their sins, representatively at least. Now then, John says, here is Jesus of Nazareth. Here is that Lamb of God that He is the one who is truly taking away the sins. John would repeat this in chapter 1 and verse 36 as recorded by the Apostle John. He says, in looking upon Jesus as He walked, He said, Behold the Lamb of God. Here is that one who is the Lamb of God. He is that one who is, and going back to his previous statement, that one who is the Lamb of God that's taking away the sins of the world. He is that Lamb of God, that perfect sacrifice who did no sin, who is without spot and blemish. And that's really when you go back into the Old Testament again and look at the lambs that they were to offer. It had to be without spot, without blemish. There couldn't be anything wrong with that lamb. It had to be a perfect sacrifice. Here is the sacrifice of Jesus, a perfect sacrifice, without spot, without blemish. He is that true lamb of God who is thus able to take the sins of the world away. And thus it's no wonder. In Ephesians 1 and verse 7, Paul would write, In whom, talking about in Christ, we have redemption through His blood, even the forgiveness of sins according to the riches of His grace. And he repeated this in writing to the Colossian brethren, in whom we have redemption through His blood, even the forgiveness of sins. In Christ, there is the forgiveness of sins. And just as additional information here. Paul says here is what is in Christ. He would later tell us in Romans 6 chapter and verse 3 and Galatians 3 and verse 27 how we get into Christ. Now in Christ is where we have the remission of sins. We have redemption through the blood of Christ. How do we get into Christ? Those two passages are the only passages in the Bible that tell us how to get into Christ and it is through that act of baptism. And baptism, what are we doing? It is a likeness of the death of Christ. What is the death of Christ? That's where Christ died for our sins. He shed His blood. And thus we come in contact with that blood of Jesus Christ in that act of baptism. As we're baptized in the water. And then we're in that baptism, we're buried with Him by baptism in water. And then as Christ was raised from the dead, we are raised from the dead. We were dead spiritually. We died to that old man of sin and we're raised now to walk in newness of life in that act of baptism. But we're coming in contact with the blood of Jesus Christ which is able to take away our sins. Thus, truly, in Christ, we have redemption through His blood, the forgiveness of sins. Why? Because He is that sinless sacrifice. He's that only one that is able to take away our sins. But He is thus the only one and the only way of salvation. Jesus said in John the 14th chapter and verse 6 as He's speaking to His apostles, I am the way, the truth, the life. No man cometh unto the Father but by Me. Definite article is there in relationship to each one of those. I'm the way. There's no other way. Definite article. It is the way. Not just a way of many ways, and that's yet the way in which the denominational world would have us to believe. That's what other religious systems would have us to believe. That he is one way, yes, but there might be other ways as well. And thus, you ask, for example, those who are religious today as far as what we generally refer to as in Christendom. What about the Jew over here? Is he going to be saved? Well, yes. How? He doesn't believe in Christ. Oh, well, he'll be saved. How can he be saved without Christ? 
Christ is the way. No man comes unto the Father but by Him. There is no other way. Well, what about Muhammad? There is no other way. Christ is the way and the only way. No man. Doesn't matter if uh, we live here in America, whether it's in Russia or Africa or India or England or anywhere else. Doesn't make any difference. No man comes into the Father but by Christ. He is the only way. And that's what our text is saying here. I am the door. There's no other way. I'm not just a door among many doors. I'm the only one. The idea of religious pluralism, that there's just many ways and that we're all going to the same place just by different ways, is as false as can be. There is only one way. All other ways are false and will lead to eternal torment. And thus, when you try and change and alter God's Word, that one way, you try and make a different way. And you rejected Jesus as the way. You rejected Him as the door of salvation. And thus, there is no salvation. Peter would state, as recorded by uh, Luke and in Acts the fourth chapter and verse twelve, that neither is there salvation in any other. There is none other name under heaven given among men whereby we must be saved. There is salvation no other place. The name of Christ is the only way of salvation. And thus, as Jesus says, I am the door. If you want salvation, if you want to be saved, if you want to have your sins taken away by the blood that I shed, I am the only way. You can't have it through animal sacrifices. Those animal sacrifices simply typified the sacrifice that Jesus was going to make. And it was looking forward and pointing to that sinless sacrifice that he's going to make. And as we look back now upon that sacrifice, it's the only one that will save. Thus, Jesus is the door of salvation. And if we want to be saved, we're going to have to have and accept that salvation which he has to offer. But a second idea is that Jesus is the door to peace. In Isaiah, the ninth chapter, and verse 6, it's prophesied, For unto us a child is born, Unto us a son is given, and the government shall be upon his shoulders, and his name shall be called Wonderful, Counselor, the Mighty God, the Everlasting Father, the Prince of Peace. Now, we don't have time to look at this verse in detail, but notice here's a child is born, a son is given. That's looking at toward that miraculous virgin birth that takes place that God is giving unto us a child, a son. Notice that the government shall be upon his shoulders. That is, he is the one who's going to rule. God has given him all authority. Matthew, the 28th chapter, Jesus declares that he has all authority in heaven and in earth. Verse 18, Matthew. That he has, that he is truly the head over all things to the church. Ephesians 1, 22 and 23, and Colossians 1 and verse 18. There's the authority. You know, premillennialism, that pernicious, false doctrine, and really I shouldn't call it a doctrine, it's a system of faith, a system of belief. It's false to the core. Everything about it is false. But it claims that Jesus is not now king. He's not ruling. Now they claim he's going to come back to this earth to rule and reign, but he's not ruling and reigning now. 
Thus, the government is not on his shoulders at this time, according to premillennial doctrine. The Bible proclaims otherwise that he is King of kings and Lord of lords. 1 Timothy 6 and verse 15 and Revelation 19 chapter and verse 14. He is that one who is ruling. Government is upon his shoulders. But then he calls him several names, Wonderful, Counselor, the Mighty God, the Everlasting Father, but the one we're interested right now in, the Prince of Peace. That through him, peace is going to come. And thus as he's speaking to his apostles prior to his uh, crucifixion, John the 14th chapter, in verse 27, he says, Peace I leave with you. My peace I give unto you, not as the world giveth give I unto you. Let not your heart be troubled, neither let it be afraid. I am giving you peace. Peace, true peace, comes through Jesus. He is the door to peace. Peace, though, when we look at the aspect of peace, peace is not simply the absence of alarm. A lot of people, and uh, notice uh, there in John 14 and verse 27 again, when he says, Peace I leave you, leave you, my peace I give you, not as the world give. You see, the, the world thinks of peace as, from a physical standpoint that it's simply the absence of alarm. There's no battles going on at the time. We're not in a battle zone where there's shooting and fighting and such. And thus, if you don't have that, you have peace. And thus, our government many times will gather together two warring factions and ridiculously think if we give them enough money, they'll be, make peace with each other. And so we dole out a whole bunch of money to them and they quit fighting for a while and we proclaim, see I made peace over there. No, you just got them to quit fighting, but that's the peace of the world. That's the way wor the world thinks of it. But true peace, the peace that God is setting forth or Christ is setting forth here, and the peace of the Bible has nothing to do with that. It's not as the world giveth. Instead of it, it being the absence of fighting, in reality, Jesus is saying even in the face of fighting, even in the midst of fighting and battles and warfare, peace is possible. The peace that I get at least. It's not the absence of alarm. That's not what peace is. Peace is the tranquility of mind that really comes from a right relationship with God. And we'll look at that in just a moment a little bit more. But it is, and notice again, John 14 and verse 27, that Jesus is saying, I'm giving you peace. It's not the peace of the world. But then notice the last statement, the last phrase in this, because it explains his peace. Let not your heart be troubled, neither let it be afraid. You see, there's an inner tranquility, an inner calm. That's the peace that Christ has to offer. What about the outward circumstances? Doesn't matter. To use the old an old illustration, uh, you know, there's supposedly no atheist in foxholes. Well, even in a foxhole, you can have peace. At least the peace that Christ gives. You mean the bullets might be whizzing by my head? Yes, I can still have peace. I have an inner calm and tranquility. Let not your heart be troubled, neither let it be afraid. As we'll notice in just a moment or two, Paul, even though arrested, might die. 
and write about the peace of God and enjoy the peace of God. But first, there's four aspects, I think, to this peace. And each one probably deserves a lesson all on its own, but we won't do that this morning. The first is there's peace with God. In Romans 5th chapter and verse 1, Paul writes, Therefore, being justified by faith, we have peace with God through our Lord Jesus Christ. And let me hasten to add, because in a discussion with someone just this past week, they mentioned this verse and said we have peace, or we're justified by faith only. No, that's not what it says. And I realize Martin Luther added the word only to his translation. But those who add to God's word are going to be condemned. He hated the epistle of John and called, or James and called it a right scrawny epistle because he could not harmonize his false views of faith only with what James had written in James the second chapter. Yes, it is being justified by faith, but the justification by faith is talking about God's word here. We are justified by the word of God. And as a result, we have peace with God through Jesus Christ. Why? Because Jesus Christ can take away those sins that we've committed within our life. And as a result of that, we have tranquility with God. We have peace with God. We're not at war with Him from, from a spiritual standpoint. We are in a right relationship with God. In Ephesians, the second chapter, Paul is dealing specifically with the aspect of Jew and Gentile and the the wall of partition that was between them. And sometime you might go back, we won't have time really to develop this, but go back to Ephesians 2, verse 8 through verse 10. And notice the aspect, we are saved by grace through faith, that not of yourselves is a gift of God, not of works, lest any man should boast. And tie that in with what it, the context is in the latter part of chapter 2. Here's the works of the law of Moses. And it shows that how the Gentiles, for example, verse 12, were separated from these things. And they were separated from Christ. And thus they had no hope. But now then in Christ, Christ has broken down that middle wall of partition between us. That that separated the Jew from the Gentile. He's destroyed that which separated them. He took it out of the way, nailing it to his cross. And now then, notice verse 16 and verse 17. That he might reconcile both unto God in one body by the cross. Having slain the enmity. What was the enmity? That was that middle wall of petition that was between them. That enmity that was between Jew and Gentile was the law of Moses. Having slain the enmity thereby and came and preached peace to the you which were far off, that's the Gentile, and to them that were nigh, the Jews. That God, or that Christ is preaching peace. Peace with God. For both Jew and Gentile. Gentile didn't have that prior to the breaking down of that middle wall of petition. But now then, everyone can have it through Jesus Christ. They can have peace with God. And that peace with God comes through Jesus Christ and our obedience to Him and His will. When we through that act of baptism based upon our faith and our repenting of our sins. We are baptized in water. We are coming in contact with the blood of Jesus Christ which washes away our sins. And thus, through Jesus Christ, we have that peace. When we are baptized in water and those sins are washed away and now then I am in that right relationship with God and thus I have peace with Him. But also... Second, I can have peace with self. 
John 14 and verse 1, as Jesus began speaking to his apostles, he tells them, Let not your heart be troubled, neither let it be afraid. In the passage that we read in John the 14th chapter in verse 27, where Jesus says, Peace I leave with you, my peace I give unto you, not as the world giveth, give I unto you. Let not your heart be troubled, neither let it be afraid. That's an inner peace, an inner calm, an inner tranquility. The Hebrews writer would write in Hebrews 13 and verse 5, To let your conversation be without covetousness, and be content with such things as you have. For he has said, I will never leave thee, nor forsake thee. In other words, I can have peace. I don't have to be in alarm or alarm. I can be content within my own life. There's peace that comes through Jesus Christ, a peace with self. Sadly, a lot of people today don't have that type of peace because they do not know Jesus Christ and they have not obeyed the gospel of Jesus Christ. But then a third thing, we can have peace with others. Revel or Romans 12th chapter and verse 18 says, If it be possible, as much as lieth in you, live peaceably with all men. In Hebrews 12 and verse 14, we're told, Follow peace with all men and holiness without which no man shall see the Lord. Follow peace with all men. They're trying to make peace. You're at peace with others. Why? Because you have that tranquility of mind based upon your knowledge that you're in a right relationship with God and thus at peace with God. And having peace with God, I can have peace with self. And when I have peace with self... It's not all that difficult to have peace with others. Now, it's not always going to be the case that they're going to be peaceful with us. They're going to many times hate us because we're exposing their life. Why are we exposing their life? Because we're peacemakers. That is, we're trying to have, or we're trying to make it where they have peace. And that for them to have peace, what is it? They're going to have to have peace with God. And that takes obedience to the gospel of Jesus Christ. And in order to have that obedience to the gospel of Jesus Christ, they need to be convicted of their sins and come to a realization that I, have, I am in need of a Savior. And when you're convicting people of sins, many times they don't appreciate it and they don't like it. But as far as we're concerned, we have peace. And we try to have peace with others as well. We live in a type of lifestyle that will bring about peace with others. And that is, in reality, the entirety of the New Testament teaching us how to live in relationship with others. But then a fourth thing, we have peace with circumstances. The circumstances that we might find ourselves under. In... Well, first James, the first chapter. James is dealing with the persecution and the afflictions that are going to come upon the Christian because he is a Christian. And he says, in, as he begins this, James 1, verses 3 and verse 4, Knowing this, that the trying of your faith worketh patience. But let patience have a perfect work, that you may be perfect and entire, wanting nothing. Here's the trying of your faith. Here's the persecutions. Here's the problems that will come upon you as a result of you being a Christian. And what is it? You have patience. You have, or you have peace in relationship to that which is coming upon you. In Philippians, the fourth chapter, Well, let me mention this first, verse 13. When Paul says that I can do all things through Christ which strengtheneth me. Within the context of this, if you go back to chapter 1, we can have unity. I can have unity with others. And you see that with verse 2 as well. But also in verse 2, I can have the same mind. I can be like-minded with others. And in verse 4, we see that we can rejoice. I can rejoice. 
in verse 5. I can be without anxiety. That's peace with self. Verse 7, I can be at peace. Here is the peace of God. But skip down to verse uh, 11 and verse 12 in particular, what I want to get to. Where Paul says, Not that I speak in respect of want, for I have learned in whatsoever state I am therewith to be content. I know how to be abased and I know how to abound. Everywhere and in all things I am instructed both to be full and to be hungry, both to abound and to suffer need. What is it? Here's the circumstances of my life. doesn't matter what they are. Whatever those circumstances are, I can have peace. I can be content no matter what the circumstances are, whether I am poor and in need of food or whether I'm filled, have food of plenty and rich. The circumstances that are surrounding me will not affect my peace. Why? Because I have the peace of God that passeth all understanding. That's the type of peace that we can have if we will accept the salvation that is found only in Jesus Christ. And that as we repent of our sins based upon our faith, upon Jesus as God's Son, and we are then immersed in the water for the forgiveness of our sins, we have the type of peace that we can have, peace with God, that will bring about and lead to peace with self. Peace with whatever circumstances we might be found in. Because Paul was, when he wrote that Philippian letter, in jail in Rome. And he was going to face Caesar Nero. Because he had appealed to Nero. And Nero could say put him to death or let him go. And in the face of that he could say I have peace. Peace with circumstances as well. And peace with others. True peace, the peace that Christ gives and that can only come through Him and when we are obedient to Him. Now, if you don't have that peace this morning, then why not? Is it because you've never obeyed the gospel of Jesus Christ and thus gotten into that peaceful relationship with God? Or maybe you have, but you haven't lived in such a way that you continue to live and to have that peace with God because you've not lived the faithful type of life that God expects us to live. If you don't have that type of peace, then you can have it this morning through obedience to the gospel or whether you need to repent and come back into Him and let us pray with you for the forgiveness of your sins. You can have peace. The peace that Christ gives. Not the absence of alarm. Because the outward circumstances aren't going to matter. But you can have that inner tranquility of mind knowing that you are in a right relationship with God. And thus true peace. You need to come this morning. We plead with you to do so as we stand and sing the invitation song.